At Eldridge, our approach is very simple. We invest in what people need and what people want. It turns out that what the people need and want is a £280 million midfield trio of Enzo Fernandez, Moises Caicedo and Romeo Lavia, Mikhailo Mudrik for almost £90 million, Wesley Fofana for £75 million, and 19 other signings for a combined total in excess of £400 million and all in the space of just 12 months. Yeah, the people can be pretty demanding like that. When a consortium led by Todd Bowley bought Chelsea in May 2022, most people expected the Blues' spending to be reined in. After all, Chelsea had spent more money on transfers over the past 20 years under their sanctioned owner Roman Abramovich than any other team in world football. Abramovich personally injected £1.5 billion of his own money into Chelsea, writing off losses of almost £900 million. The early years of Abramovich's ownership, as he attempted to break up the Premier League duopoly of Manchester United and Arsenal, were particularly free-spending. Adjusted for football-specific inflation, Chelsea's 2003-04, 2004-05, and 2005-06 seasons are still the three highest-spending seasons any club has ever had in the Premier League, other than Chelsea themselves, in 2022-23. It wasn't just that Abramovich had invested an absolute fortune in Chelsea, and the club had outspent everyone else in world football, that made people expect more frugality from Chelsea's new owners. It was also the nature of who those new owners were. Of Chelsea's four new co-owners, two are American hedge fund and private equity investors, with hundreds of billions of dollars in assets under management, including co-controlling owner and club chairman Todd Bowley, one is actually an American private equity firm itself, Clear Lake Capital, and the odd one out, to a certain extent, is Hans-Jörg Weiss, Todd Bowley's business partner, and an 87-year-old Swiss billionaire who made his fortune in medical devices. If there's one thing that European football fans associate with American owners, other than them using terms like zero, zero, and shutout, and particularly American private equity and hedge fund owners, it is financial prudence. Whether it be the Glazers at Manchester United, who have taken over a billion pounds out of the club through interest, debt repayments and dividends, John Henry at Liverpool, who have a lower net spend than Aston Villa over the last three seasons, despite being the third richest football club in the world, or Marseille, the biggest club in France by fan base and attendances, who have spent less money than Bournemouth since Frank McCourt's takeover in 2016, American private equity investors tend to be quite miserly in terms of their spending, at least compared to Middle Eastern states and Russian oligarchs when they buy European football clubs. Blue Co Consortium and Todd Bowley haven't just bucked that trend and defied all expectations, though. They have become by far the highest spending football club in the entire history of the sport. So, in the words of Roy Hodgson, What's going on here? Did Todd Bowley and Clear Lake Capital leave their private equity hats at the door when they arrived at Stamford Bridge? And this is just some kind of mad project to see how much money you can spend before being imposed with serious sanctions? Is there an elaborate master plan at hand that no one yet knows about? Or is someone at Chelsea HQ deliberately adding a zero to all of their transfer bids because they secretly hate Americans and want Roman back? They are all compelling theories, I'm sure you would agree, but there is another suggestion, even more compelling I might suggest, but no less unusual. We tend to forget in Europe, where all Americans are just stereotyped as badly dressed tourists who talk far too loudly in restaurants with no sense of self-awareness, that not all Americans are the same. Some of them don't wear hideous shirt, short, and sandal combinations, aren't in a permanent state of hurried confusion, and don't feel the need to spend an entire meal shouting about their experience island hopping around Greece, or exploring Italy's Amalfi Coast to their friend sat three feet away from them. Sorry Americans, I know that you're not all like that, but some stereotypes can be tough to shake. Likewise, not all hedge funds, holding companies, and private equity firms are the same. 
don't get me wrong, they are all the same in the sense that all they care about is money, and they would happily make thousands of people unemployed, deny them access to life-saving healthcare, and run a school bus off the edge of a cliff for an extra dollar, but they are not all the same in terms of how they make their money, and who they choose to sacrifice in the process. Elliott Investment Management, for example, who owned AC Milan between July 2018 and July 2022, specialise in distressed assets and securities. Most of Elliott Management's acquisitions are of bankrupt or near-bankrupt companies who are in the process of defaulting on their loans. Often loans, incidentally, which are owed to Elliott Management themselves. In fact, that is precisely how the firm ended up acquiring AC Milan. Chinese businessman Li Yonghong acquired AC Milan from Silvio Berlusconi for 720 million euros in 2016, at the height of Chinese domestic and international football investment, but it didn't take long for Yonghong's investment and China's investment in football as a whole to sour. AC Milan took out a 415 million euro loan from Elliott Management on Yong Hong's watch, but when the club defaulted on the loan, the American investment firm led by Paul Singer acquired Yong Hong's 99.93% stake in the club. Milan invested heavily in Yong Hong's two years at the helm with a net spend of 151 million euros, almost three times as much as Juventus over the same period, and successive six-place finishes in Serie A led to grave financial uncertainty. Elliott Management injected just 50 million euros in equity capital into the club in order to stabilise their finances, and Singer announced his intention to return AC Milan to quote, the pantheon of top European football clubs where it rightly belongs. Although Elliott Management signalled their lofty ambitions, it was to be a gradual rise, fueled by spending in moderation. AC Milan finished 5th, 6th and 2nd, before winning their first Serie A title since 2011 in 2022. Following that success, Elliott Management sold AC Milan to Redbird Capital Partners, another American investment firm, for a fee of 1.2 billion euros. Redbird were only able to raise 900 million euros for the acquisition, so they loaned the remaining 300 million euros from, you guessed it, Elliott Management, in order to buy AC Milan from Elliott Management for 1.2 billion euros, with a 7% interest rate on that 300 million euro loan, plus an additional 8% payment in kind upon maturity. Most AC Milan fans are grateful for the way in which Elliott Management turned the club's fortunes around, from being heavily indebted to winning the Scudetto. But in reality, Milan were no different to a pet food store or a semiconductor manufacturer in Elliott and Singer's eyes. They were a distressed asset, which they acquired for a discounted price, saw potential in, managed to stabilise, and then sold for a significant profit. It is what Elliott Management does, or at least attempts to do, with almost all of their investments. That is one way of doing things. Another way is to buy businesses which you feel have the potential for rapid growth and expansion, either with the aim of making them extremely profitable long term, taking them public, or having a major exit at some stage in the future. We have seen this in the past on a much smaller scale in football, with owners typically in the championship, who engage in loss-making levels of spending with the aim of unlocking Premier League riches or having a big exit often to devastating effect, when they don't manage to pull it off. We have never seen it attempted, however, at a club like Chelsea, who are already one of the biggest, richest, and most successful teams in English and European football. But could that be what Bluco and Bowley are attempting? It would certainly explain a lot. Chelsea themselves were actually a distressed asset in the spring of 2022, with owner Roman Abramovich's assets, including Chelsea, having been frozen by the UK government. That often leads to a reduced sale price, but the level of interest in Chelsea was such that Bowley, Clearlake and Co. ended up paying £2.5 billion to acquire the club, with further assurances, supposedly in writing, of a minimum investment of at least £1.75 billion, over the next 10 years. So far, they are on course to meet that spending commitment in about two. Football clubs can be difficult companies to value. 
Chelsea, for example, had a track record of being a loss-making business which required intense cash injections and was in desperate need of major infrastructure investment, and even with those funds, finding a suitable site to build in the heart of West London proved difficult even with Roman Abramovich's bottomless pockets. In case none of the above was enough to deter you, though, Bluco acquired Chelsea right at the moment that interest rates had started to rise. For the past 13 years, interest rates hadn't exceeded 1%, now nicknamed the era of cheap or free money. The significance of rising interest rates in this context is difficult to overstate. The Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, which cost Spurs roughly a billion pounds to build, was constructed between 2016 to 2019, when the Bank of England's interest rate ranged from 0.25 to 0.75%, and there were similarly low rates throughout the developed world. In September 2019, Tottenham refinanced £525 million of the £637 million in debt that the club took out to build their new ground, converting it into bonds with a fixed rate of 2.66% interest and an average maturity period of 23 years. The interest on that loan will still end up costing Tottenham somewhere in the region of £440 million, or about 45% of the total amount that they will repay, but their stadium ought to generate enormous revenue for them over the next 23 years, and at the end of that period, they will still own the ground. A similar loan in 2023, with an interest rate of 6.7 to 6.8%, given the Bank of England's base rate is now 5.25%, and further increases can't be ruled out, would result in an interest payment of roughly £2 billion, or nearly 80% of the total amount repaid. That is an increase of more than 3x, and it would equate to an extra £67 million outgoing every year for 23 years, or equivalent to about 15% of Chelsea's current revenue. It is for all of those reasons that a lot of people felt, and still think, even more strongly in some cases, that Bluco and Bowley significantly overpaid for Chelsea. The Markham multivariate model, developed by Tom Markham in 2013, specifically for the purpose of trying to value football clubs, put Chelsea's valuation at the time at between £1.25 to £1.5 billion, KPMG valued the club at £1.7 billion, and only Forbes at £2.4 billion came anywhere close to the amount that the consortium actually paid. Of course, the value of something, in financial terms, is only ever what someone is willing to pay for it, and Bowley's consortium appear to be confident that they didn't overpay for Chelsea. There is only one way in which they can be proven right, and that is if Chelsea are able to significantly ramp up their revenue, and with it, their valuation by more traditional, non-football-related metrics. In that sense, then, Chelsea are a little bit more like a growth stock, which Bowley and Bluco believe they can rapidly expand with intense early investment. It might seem strange to a lot of people, but some of the biggest companies and most recognisable brands in the world aren't actually profitable. Or not yet, at least. Uber posted record revenue of $8.1 billion for the second quarter of 2022, up 33% year over year, yet the company still lost $2.6 billion over the same period. Nonetheless, Uber stock rose on that news, with markets and analysts impressed with their growth and the fact that they only lost $2.6 billion. Amazon, which is the fourth largest company in the world by revenue, and the second largest which isn't predominantly state-owned, didn't actually have its first profitable year until 2003, having launched in 1994. Tesla, the world's ninth largest company by market capitalization, founded in 2003, didn't turn a full year profit until 2020. Other non-profitable giants include the likes of Deliveroo, Peloton, Spotify, Lyft, and, obviously, Twitter. In fact, most technology companies aren't profitable, and that is largely through design. Netflix, if they wanted to, could have become profitable very quickly as an early mover, and the biggest player in the streaming game, by simply spending less on acquiring and producing new TV shows and movies than they made through subscriptions. 
Given the company's revenue is $32 billion a year, you wouldn't have thought that would be too difficult. And indeed it wouldn't. But if Netflix were to scale back its spending, whilst the likes of Disney Plus, with an enormous back catalogue and blockbusters, Amazon Prime, Apple TV, and others all entered the market and outspent them, they would rapidly start to lose customers and subscribers to platforms which could offer better content. For the exact same reason, most streaming services launch with subscription fees, which they know aren't sustainable and will result in them making heavy losses, on the basis that they want to gain a large subscriber base to begin with, and then they will look to gradually increase prices with time, just as Netflix have done in recent years. Sure, most growth stocks might be relatively new, compared to the big blue chip and more established businesses, and Chelsea are 118 years old, but the model would appear to be the same. Bluco and Bowley, from all the evidence, and indeed from some of the comments that they have made, are perfectly happy to sustain fairly heavy losses in the first few years of their ownership, if the end result is massively increased revenue. Bowley, like most Americans, hence why they keep buying European football clubs, is basically of the view that Europeans are rubbish at marketing, and at the whole capitalism thing in general. Sure, the Premier League might be by far and away the most lucrative league in world football, with a £10 billion three-year media rights deal and £5.5 billion in annual revenue, but Bowley and others feel that that is still far short of where it should be. As Bowley likes to point out, the NFL, with an estimated 170 million fans, has annual revenue of roughly $18 billion three times as much as the Premier League, despite European football having an estimated 4 billion fans worldwide, which is over 20 times the size of the NFL's overall fan base. Of course, NFL fans, who are highly concentrated in the United States, are likely to be more affluent, on average, than Premier League fans, who are scattered around the entire globe. But nonetheless, there are only four countries on Earth where the Premier League isn't broadcast, namely Afghanistan, North Korea, Cuba, and Turkmenistan, and put simply, in terms of interest, no other sport, and indeed, no other league, even comes close. It's for that reason that Bowley considers Chelsea, given that investors can't buy Real Madrid, Barcelona, or Bayern Munich, they are owned by their fans, socios, or members, to be potentially the biggest brand in world sport that he and Bluco could have bought. Manchester United and Liverpool might have something to say about that, but you can at least see his thesis. And, whilst not as big of a brand yet, Chelsea have actually been far more successful than both of them over the past 10-15 to 15 years. The strategy at Liverpool, broadly speaking, under John W. Henry, is to remain competitive and self-sufficient, spending within the club's means, and then just watch the value of your asset appreciate in line with other elite-level football clubs and Premier League teams as the revenue of the league gradually increases with every new cycle. And you would have to say, they have been extremely good at it. Henry paid just £300 million for Liverpool through his Fenway Sports Group holding company in 2010. Now that is roughly the same as the estimated value of Crystal Palace. Liverpool, meanwhile, are now worth an estimated £3.8 billion, an increase of £3.5 billion in the space of just 13 years. And throughout that time, Henry has only actually provided £110 million of financing for the club. Up to now then, the value of Henry's overall investment in Liverpool has compounded at 18.7% annually over the past 13 years as a whole, outperforming even impressive stock market returns over that period by 5%. Who says that owning a football club can't be a profitable business? The Glazers at Manchester United have a similar strategy of riding the wave of capital appreciation without doing very much, with the added bonus in their case of extracting wealth from the club in the form of interest, debt repayments and dividends. You know, it's easy work if you can get it. Bowley and Bluco's strategy, however, isn't just to ride the wave, hope for business as usual, and to make bank whenever they sell. They want to radically increase Chelsea's revenue and valuation, and are willing to lose large amounts of money in the short term in order to get Chelsea where they want the club to be, and to realise their revenue ambitions. 
The issue for Bowley and Bluco on that front is that, unlike Silicon Valley startups, European football clubs are heavily regulated. The Premier League has its own profit and sustainability rules, meanwhile UEFA's financial fair play, or FFP regulations, might not apply to Chelsea this season, but one imagines that they will be anticipating a swift return to European football next season. The Premier League's profit and sustainability rules allow clubs a loss of £5 million a year, which can be boosted by £30 million of secure funding, and is averaged out over a three-year period. Effectively, therefore, clubs are permitted to lose a maximum of £105 million over a three-year span. Back in January, I made a whole video about the crazy contract lengths Chelsea were handing out, and how they were avoiding falling foul of the league's financial regulations. Everything in that video is still relevant and true. In terms of how Chelsea theoretically could avoid breaking profit and sustainability, and later FFP rules. But there is now a recent train of thought, prompted by their continued enormous spending this window, despite the fact that they finished 12th last season and don't have the benefits of European income this season, that Chelsea aren't that bothered if they do exceed spending limits and break the rules at all. That might seem ridiculous. Why would anyone openly and intentionally break the rules, bringing economic and possibly even sporting sanctions upon themselves? But again, it goes back to the same startup and tech bro mindset of smashing things up, breaking the rules, and looking to exploit whatever opportunities open up. These are the sorts of people who call themselves disruptors and consider themselves the greatest minds of their generation while starving themselves for 18 hours a day and injecting orangutan semen into their eyeballs. I'm not saying that Todd Bowley does that, just to be clear. We're doing stereotypes again. It's worth noting, just to flesh this idea out a bit, that Mark Walters and Todd Bowley, two of Chelsea's four co-owners, did something very similar with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Three years after becoming co-owners of the MLB franchise through their Guggenheim Baseball Management Ownership Group, the Dodgers faced a dilemma. New international signing period rules meant that the Dodgers had a spending pool limit of $2 million. Instead of remaining within their limit though, the Dodgers went out and spent $20 million, more than any other team in the league. Major League Baseball responded by charging the Dodgers a 100% penalty on all spending above their allotment and reduced their pool for the next two seasons to just $300,000. Bowley and the Guggenheim group considered the punishment to be a worthwhile trade-off, though, for the extravagant spending that they've been able to make that season. The Rodgers were World Series runners-up in 2017 and 2018, and winners in 2020. Could that be what Bowley and Bluco are doing at Chelsea? It certainly seems feasible. The sanctions imposed on the Dodgers eight years ago were solely financial, and their spending returned them to the summit of Major League Baseball for the first time since 1988. Now the Dodgers are the second most valuable team in Major League Baseball, valued at over $4 billion. If Chelsea's spending can lead them to Premier League and Champions League success, combined with Bowley's innovative ideas to increase revenue twofold from £500 million to more than a billion, turning the club into a £10 billion valuation business, then £900 million of spending in two seasons and some economic sanctions will have been a risk worth taking. If Chelsea are hit with sporting sanctions, on the other hand, that changes the stakes pretty significantly. A points deduction, for instance, could be the difference between winning or missing out on the Premier League title or qualifying versus failing to qualify for the UEFA Champions League. Retrospective sporting punishments could even see Chelsea stripped of honours and titles, and UEFA could ban Chelsea for multiple seasons from their competitions, not only doing massive reputational damage to the club, but also crippling Bowley's revenue and valuation ambitions, given how much Champions League football is worth. None of these are risks that Bowley, Clear Lake, and the rest of Blue Co's investors won't have considered and scrutinised in far greater detail, and with much more expensive advice it should be said, than I have done in this video. That's not to say that it isn't still an enormous risk. It absolutely is. 
Chelsea are doing a whole raft of firsts right now. They are the first team to spend over half a billion pounds in a single season, the first Premier League team to possibly willingly break spending regulations, and the first to offer several of their players six, seven, and even eight and a half year contracts. The reason that no one else does that, despite the amortization and accounting benefits, is because if they sign a dud, you are lumbered with them, likely on a salary that makes them tough to budge for an awfully long time. Spreading the cost out for accounting purposes is one thing, but it increases your capital spending over future seasons, and wage expenditure is the single biggest expense at every major football club now. Bowley believes that he can double Chelsea's revenue and treble their valuation, and he doesn't seem to be too bothered about how he manages to get there, what rules Chelsea might break in the process, and who he might upset. If Chelsea wildly breaks spending regulations, which is feasible, it could result in a watershed moment for both the Premier League and UEFA, and a real test of their mettle in terms of how much muscle they've got when it comes to actually enforcing their own rules. There is a perception, with some basis in fact, PSG spring to mind, that they are pretty toothless when it comes to the big boys, of which Chelsea are undoubtedly one. The precedent that would set if Chelsea flagrantly disregarded the rules and received little more than a slap on the wrist would be monumental. It would render profit and sustainability as inconsequential as it is already considered to be in the minds of many football fans. The ambition, newness, and potential consequences of Bowley's project at Chelsea will make it fascinating to watch. It is just unclear as of yet whether it will be fascinating like a great epoch-defining innovation or fascinating like a plane crash where the pilot thought that he knew best and decided to wander off course. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and of course, goes without saying, make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on, not just for this channel, but also my second channel, both of which should be on your screens now, along with that video that I mentioned earlier on about Chelsea in relation to FFP and their contracts, and another video that YouTube thinks that you might enjoy. But what do they know? You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at hitc7s on both, should you wish to do so.